that sense a hostile act. The canal reopened in June 1914. It was a festive occasion. For the celebrations, the German high seas fleet welcomed a courtesy squadron of four British dreadnoughts and three cruisers. In mid-afternoon on Sunday the 28th of June, an urgent telegram reached the Kaiser ship Hohenzollern. It was chilling news. The Kaiser's close friend Archduke Francis Ferdinand of Austria had been assassinated, along with his wife, in the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo. The festivities at Kiel ended abruptly. The ships of the Royal Navy sailed from German waters to take up their stations in the event of war. There was no hate against Germany and within the German naval uh, officer corps there was no hate against uh, the British. And when the British ships uh, left the harbour of Kiel, they made the single uh, friends today, friends in future, friends forever. A single gunshot in the Balkans had sparked the First World War. And when German boots trampled neutral Belgium, British troops were mobilised in pursuit. But if the land was to be where the dying took place, both Britain and Germany knew it was the sea where the war could be won or lost, in a single decisive battle. On the eve of hostilities, British Admiralty made a far-sighted decision to move its main naval base to Scarpa Flow, off the northern coast of Scotland. In this isolated, windswept harbour, the Royal Navy assembled the most powerful battle fleet in history. Thirty-three dreadnought battleships would spearhead its imposingly named Grand Fleet. Four fast battle cruisers would act as scouts in advance of the battle fleet. This new class of capital ship was identical to battleships in firepower, but gained extra speed at the expense of armour protection. A designer vessel yet to be tested in war at sea. Scores of support vessels, submarines, torpedo craft, destroyers and cruisers would scout for and attack enemy ships, as well as screen their own capital ships in battle. With 177 large warships on call, Britain possessed a formidable superiority over Germany of two to one. When war starts in 1914, no one really knows what a big naval battle will be like. No one has ever concentrated the number of modern battleships the British have in one place. No one knows how well they can be controlled. No one knows how well they can hit at the ranges that they, they claim to fight at. So every naval officer in the world is waiting to see what a big battle will be like. Winston Churchill's ultimate aim was to bring the German high seas fleet to battle and destroy it with his massive fleet of battleships and battlecruisers. But instead of enticing his enemy to sea with a close blockade of their coast, Churchill confounded Germany by ordering a distant blockade. The British immediately do what Tirpitz does not expect. He expects them to follow Royal Naval tradition and try some sort of Copenhagening maneuver, which means they will immediately move on German naval bases, confront the German fleet, and try to destroy it prematurely before it can get itself prepared. Uh, they don't adopt that at all, right? They pull away from the coast and set up a standoff blockade. 
which means the next move is the German move. The Germans don't know what to do. Alfred Tirpitz argued for an all-out sea battle with Britain, even though the Kaiser had brought on the war too early and his fleet was far from optimum strength. He was not at all prepared for war, and he knew it. This is no uh, illusion as far as he was concerned. Would he share that uh, with the Reichstag? Certainly not. Would he share that with many of his lesser commanders? Certainly not. Germany's first blooding in the war at sea was to have an enormous impact on the Kaiser. As thousands of British troops set out across the English Channel to France, British Admiralty ordered a daring diversionary mission to ensure their safe passage. British light naval forces were dispatched to intercept enemy patrols near the German coast at Heligoland Bight. With their battleships still at anchor, a flotilla of German cruisers and destroyers fell unsupported into the British trap. Despite dreadful odds, their crews took the fight to the enemy. After four hours of chaotic action, a backup squadron of Britain's powerful battle cruisers moved in. Three German light cruisers and a destroyer, along with a thousand men, were lost in the encounter. For Germany, the effect on morale far outweighed the losses in ships and men. The Kaiser issued orders limiting the power of his commanders and demanding the high seas fleet not to leave port again without his approval. From a naval point of view, this was disastrous because the Navy had been built to fight Britain and uh, to beat Britain. This was against their code of honor and as well, it also helped to destroy the confidence of the people in the Navy. With the Kaiser as its supreme commander, the German high seas fleet appeared in serious trouble from the start. The Royal Navy, on the other hand, entered the war with confidence in its leadership. Commander of the High Seas Fleet, Sir John Jellicoe, was arguably Britain's most respected sea admiral. The commander of the battle cruiser squadron, the flamboyant Vice Admiral David Beatty, immediately became a national hero for his victory at Heligoland Bight. To Winston Churchill, Britain's magnificent dreadnoughts and their crews were the culminating manifestation of naval force in the history of the world. But Germany had a wild card that no British admiral had ever had to contend with. The U-boat. In the first months of the war, U-boats sank five British cruisers and one pre-dreadnought battleship. The early successes of the undersea raider sent a clear message to Britain. The combination of the U-boat and the torpedo could wreak havoc on her battle fleet. In a letter to Churchill, Jellicoe argued for extreme caution. It would be suicide for Britain, he said, to lose her advantage over Germany in dreadnought numbers. Instead of the early sea battle everyone expected, the world's two most powerful battle fleets glared at each other across the brooding waters of the North Sea and wondered if their Trafalgar would ever come. With his battleships grounded at Wilhelmshaven, the commander of the German fleet, Admiral von Ingenohl, devised a strategy to revive the morale of his crews and, more importantly, seriously dent Britain's naval superiority. 
The German problem was that their fleet was just not strong enough to take on the British Grand Fleet and its battle cruiser supporting fleet with any chance of success. Therefore, it had to come up with rather unsatisfactory alternatives. And the least unsatisfactory alternative was to try to draw out a portion of that Grand Fleet, probably the battle cruiser fleet, which was operating increasingly autonomously out of its base in Recife, into a situation where it could trap the battle cruiser fleet and with its full strength sink it. This would be quite a shock for the British in morale terms, and it would also, particularly if, if, if it could be repeated, if the exercise could be repeated again, perhaps grind the British battle fleet down to a point where a full-scale battle was on the cards. And so the Germans begin their policy of sort of tweaking the lion's tail. With the Kaiser's approval, Admiral von Ingenoll laid a trap for Beatty's battle cruiser squadron. The bait, the towns and people of the Yorkshire coast. Audacious lightning strikes by Germany's battle cruisers brought the war to British soil for the first time. The British press condemned the targeting of innocent civilians. It was the first indication that the fledgling German Navy had little regard for tradition and moral conduct in war. On their first two sorties, the coastal raiders achieved little, slipping away before the British warships arrived at the scene. But on January the 23rd, 1915, Admiral Hipper's battlecruiser squadron set out on another raid. Their target, Britain's east coast fishing fleet, which Germany believed was laying mines and gathering information for the Admiralty. But the Royal Navy had no need for fishing trawlers for their intelligence. Unknown to Germany, Britain had in its possession a captured code book and a network of radio direction finding posts along the coast. What they don't know is the British have broken their codes, so instead of the raids being real surprises that may, may attract uh, sudden reactions by some small number of British ships, the British know when the fleet comes out. Vice Admiral Beatty's battle cruisers were ordered to sea to intercept the German raiders and bring them to battle. But what British intelligence failed to pick up was that Hipper would be supported by the entire German high seas fleet. The following day, Beatty intercepted Hipper's squadron at Dogger Bank. The Royal Navy had fallen into a German trap and faced certain defeat. Destroyers on both sides exchanged light fire. But rather than join in the battle, the German commander, Ingenoll, panicked. He ordered the high seas fleet to sail at full speed for home. The British battlecruisers gave chase. Accurate German counterfire forced Beatty's flagship Lion to retire. But in retreat, the Germans lost the fast armoured cruiser Blucher, along with more than 900 men. The Kaiser was furious over the debacle at Dogger Bank. He stood down his high seas commander for not engaging the British. Ironically, Admiral Ingenoll was merely following the Kaiser's order not to risk his beloved dreadnoughts. <laughs> 